He'll make it for sure. Now that's why I backed him on Tap Touch. Hey, Luke. Yes, Gene Simmons. He's probably the best when it comes to this stuff. Thanks, Gene. You've got the touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call 1 800 858 858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Hello and welcome to Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle for another week. And once again, I say it all the time, I've got a different co-host with me, but no shortage of things to talk about. We're fresh off an overtime classic on Melbourne Cup Eve. Maybe not a classic in a classical sense of, of the game, but it certainly was dramatic. We saw the Perth Wildcats hit back with a couple of wins. Injuries mounting across the league. The whistles certainly aren't, aren't stopping. Execution late in games is getting pretty interesting. Cody Ellis is taking a break for this week. That means we get to pick the brains of the man who's been the been a coach in the league for the last four years at the South East Melbourne Phoenix, and I'm fascinated to get his thoughts on a lot of things right now. So I'm Chris Pike, but the man you have all tuned in to hear from, Simon Mitchell, how did we find you this week? Yeah, thanks. Nice intro there, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a huge week of basketball. Just it's some mind-boggling moments, a lot of head-scratching, um, a lot of pearl grabbing and a couple of Perth wins uh, mm. in a fashion that I'm not sure has drawn up. But uh, no. yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a uh, an eventful round six for sure. Absolutely. So we're here thanks to Hoop Seven, who have been part of this show since the start. So head to hoopseven.com.au if you're where you are, Simon in Melbourne, or if you come to Perth, check them out on on Murray Street in the Perth city. And also, we're here thanks to Tap Touch and. Not easy to find a winner right now with some of the upsets around the league, Simon, but we're, we're doing our best thanks to our friends at TabTouch. I don't know where to start, Simon, because what's your take on the game? Now that this is your first time out of the league for a long time, what's it like watching games from your point of view right now? Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting perspective. Uh, I guess I'm looking at the game from a lot of different angles than, than the previous few years. Um, one, uh, the, the coverage itself. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, I'm looking at from from a coverage standpoint. You know, usually I, I you know I'd watch every game during the course of the season anyway, but I'd probably uh, notice camera angles or silly commentary moments <laughs> or um, some of the things that, that do go on during the course of the game. Well, well, um, well, actually, as much as maybe I do now that I'm Joe Schmo <laughs> in the in, in, in the two suits. Hey, 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 let me get your thoughts on that. Are you watching games on mute right now, or can you tolerate the commentary? I, I think there's some games that I give every game a chance and yeah. then I find myself putting some music on a lot of the time and having it playing in the background for various reasons. One, I, I just, if you're going down to Tassie, I think the music probably doesn't fit my taste and, mm. and that seems to be overbearing. Um, and, and yeah, look, I, I would love to hear far more like detailed commentary, what's been seen during the course of the game and maybe a little bit more preparation rather than reflection on what happened 30 years ago. Mm. There is a lot of that. I've kind of noticed that the difference when they're calling from the studio to calling courtside, I feel like when they're in the studio, it's almost like they're having a discussion like we are right now. And I feel like that's because they're in a studio and it's a more relaxed environment. When they're courtside, I feel like they do focus on the game a little bit more. Have you sort of noticed that? Yeah, uh, probably depending on who the pairings yeah, are. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah but it, it, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, even a little bit of uh, interaction between the commentary and the, and, and some of the coaches, uh, which I think's you know fun to watch. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, I, I don't think there's anyone who's going to say that I, I wouldn't it be great to get all the games in the studio again. No, no, <laughs> I just don't no. think that it was done for COVID reasons, and then uh, I don't know if it stayed on because of economic reasons. But um, yeah, I think it certainly lends itself to a better a better call when uh, when the coaches, or sorry, the uh, the commentators are, are courtside. This isn't a job interview, but. Have you been asked to be part of the TV coverage? I'm surprised that we haven't seen you pop up. I did meet with um, with some people um, at the right, when I first stepped down. It was actually the week of me stepping down, and um, mm. there was some um, positivity about bringing me in. But um, that was about the last time I heard <laughs> something about it. So, yeah, I, I went and did a podcast early uh, in the preseason, and maybe it didn't rate too well. So who knows? <laughs> but um, yeah, look, it, it's. I think there's some elements to it that I'd like to see in regards to breaking down the game a little bit more. I think Liam mm. Santa Maria does a good job of it. Yeah. Um, 
he goes in prepared. He has his numbers. Um, he, he knows what's going to take place, and I think he he, he waits for it to come, um, uh, waits for it to come out, and, and, and then commentates what he's seen and why these things are happening. But yeah, there is a lot of chit chat um, and yes. self promotion. So yes. yeah, look, it is what it is. Um, you know, maybe the way I feel about it is is, is maybe the reason I, I, I'm not doing it. I'm probably <laughs> not. A fan out there. So, yeah, they are teams. They they require teamwork. And um, yeah, I guess uh, what I'd like to see is probably different. What I'd like to hear is probably different. So yeah, putting your coach's hat on. Have you enjoyed Trevor Gleeson's edition? I. I guess it's a two-part thing. He doesn't always articulate himself that well, but what he says is spot on. I, I love seeing and hearing his insights into the game. Oh, I love to hear the warnable boy. I like he's, he's very genuine. Yep. Um, he calls it how he sees it. He's got great insights, obviously. I'd love to see him doing more games, but yeah, uh, yeah it looks like we're just going to get him on the Perth calls. But yeah, I think he does a tremendous job, obviously, as a rapport with Damo is mm. uh, very good. Yeah, I think he even during the uh, the World Cup, I thought he was a, a yes. welcome addition, and I'd like to see more of that. Um, to be honest, uh, you know, let, let's see what Joey Wright's got to say about the game. Let's let's see you know, what Bevo's thinking of the game out there. Like just just some, some different perspectives, some people who have got legitimate coaching experience in the league and have accomplished a lot, and the way they see the game and the, their their input, I think would be a lot. It would be a welcome addition mm-hmm. to, to what we currently have. It's exactly why I asked if you had been asked to be involved and also why I wanted you to come and help us out on the show because picking the brain of a guy who's just fresh out of being a head coach in the league, you don't get that chance and your insights are are second to none. So anyway, we'll wait and see. You you might get asked again. You never know who might be listening, Simon. (laughs) (laughs) My mother's done myself any favours just now. It's uh, it's a fucking bit of black sheep of the family. (laughs) Uh, all right, let's get stuck into what we're seeing on the court. Let's start with the Monday night game. Well, first of all, do you, do you like playing Monday? Monday nights in general, it looks like the league's gone away from, but on the eve of a public holiday in Melbourne for the Melbourne Cup, it was a sold-out crowd at John Kane Arena. Are you, are you happy to play on a on the eve of a, of a public holiday like that? Oh, I think it's a no-brainer. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the crowd that showed up last night was wonderful um, and loud. I think that was great drama and television for the NBL, if not great basketball at all times. Uh, and and it's, it's a big day for in the horse racing um, industry in Victoria. But if you don't care for the nags, it's uh, there's not much to do. So <laughs> yeah. I know that and I could care less about horses. So yeah. if we could stick a basketball game in there, then, then I'm all for it. No, absolutely. Um, I grew up in Geelong, so it was always a, a big day there. And I, I remember always racing home from school, even on the days we had to go to school. It was kind of hit or miss. Sometimes it was only a public holiday in Melbourne, not the rest of Victoria. Sometimes it was all of Victoria. I'm not sure what it is right now, but it was always a bit of a hit and miss day. Yeah, I think it's the whole of the state now. And yeah, uh, yeah I remember I went to a school that didn't uh, that didn't recognise the holiday. So mm. we used to go to school on, uh, on Cup Day and some of your mates would be having the day off and we're always cut about that. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't think I've watched a Melbourne Cup since 1982 when Dulcify <laughs> got put down. So there we go. it yes. just doesn't resonate with me. No, no, it doesn't. And the older I get, the less interested I've become, especially for that exact, exact reason. I mean, it, we're here to talk about basketball. What did you make of this game? Some, sometimes a close game makes a great game in the end, even if it's not a, a classical game. So, I mean, it, it was dramatic from the start when we saw Luke Travers go down with that nasty knock when he bumped into, well, yeah. he rammed into um, Ariel Huckporty. And kind of both guys were never the same Same after that. Then Ian Clark got got hurt. And late in the game, we saw Jordan Usher, you know, think he's a superhero again, hitting a three-pointer and then can't make two two free throws at the end. And and then we we thought Daly was going to be the hero with his three-point play that was taken taken off him with a coach's challenge right at the right at the death. I mean, there's so much to unpack. Where, where, do, where do you want to start? Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, the, the last three and a half minutes, which is a, it was a roller coaster ride, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. A regulation, that is. Um, it was just crazy. You know, um, the, the five Perth were going with the Jordan Usher as like the lead guard, mm-hmm. um, the ball handling player, and, and he gets. He gets that step back three on Dally in the mid pick and roll, and you're just like, oh god, what's he thinking? And he drops it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's a four point game and a bad possession um, into a one point game. So 
yeah, it was a bit of a head scratcher. And I guess the, the remainder of the game was a bit of, yeah, you know, it was just a lot of scratching heads. Um, yes. You know, that, that play itself, um, again, going back to Usher, and he had the, the, the three-point uh, make just towards the end of regulation with yeah. seven seconds. You're like, well, did you want to shoot it with seven seconds left oh, on the yeah, clock? And exactly. Give more than another ten minutes. And, 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 but the thing that impressed me with that, like the chaos down the stretch, was from a Perth standpoint was just their endeavour on the boards. Yep. It's been missing. It hasn't been there. Saar was a difference maker. Wagstaff was a difference maker just with his physicality. Doolittle was a difference maker. And, uh, and, and just that's something that Perth has been missing. And, uh, you know, well, whilst I might not have been, uh, well, I wouldn't be resting on my laurels and thinking that Jordan Nash is the answer down the stretch with a ball in his hands. Mm. The positive was those guys and Usher himself um, on the O boards as well. I just thought that's something that's really been missing from Perth um, in the in the first five rounds of the of the basketball season. No, absolutely. Um, I've got to get your thoughts when you watched when you watched it live when Delhi got the foul was called on Sar on him where he made the layup at the end and it would have been a three point play that would have put them in front. Did you think it was a foul? And when you watched the replays on the after the challenge from John Reilly, did you think they might have made the right decision? Because after the game, Dean Vickerman didn't didn't mince his words about how unhappy he was with it. It was a foul. Yep. There's no doubt it was a foul. Yep. Uh, now, I, oh, the indication I got from the close-up of Chris Reed talking into my um, living room... <laughs> um, well, that's another thing. Was that, can, can we please get rid of that out of the country? Yeah, no, we welcome the, the demise of that. But uh, <laughs> regardless, what what it was, I think, I'm not going to try to understand what, what goes on um, in the challenge booth, but from what I can gather, that they must have called a pushing foul on Saar. Mm. And they've just uh, I really did the right thing. Just challenge it. Whatever the heck yeah, it is, no, just challenge it. We've yeah. got 1.8 seconds. I'm, I'm rolling. I'm throwing course into the wind. I've got nothing to lose here. They've, they've said, well, yeah, well, it wasn't a pushing foul. He, he didn't push him in the back. He he, he slapped him on the arm. Yes. <laughs> the challenge, the, the challenging the actual call on the floor, and the call on the floor apparently was a push. Mm. So that was an incorrect call, but there was definitely a foul there. It should have been N1, and Melbourne probably should have taken the game. But uh, they didn't, and um, they had their opportunities in overtime. And, and yeah, so uh, – and even the last call after that, when Perth forward the ball, mm. and oh, you would need someone far more informed than I am in regards to – Okay, so the ball's in midair. Oh, I didn't think it was a foul on Dally. Yes. Um, I thought it was two, two athletes running at the ball, um, jumping at the ball. There's no time off the clock. So what I'm assuming is that the foul took place before the ball was touched. Yep. Now, my understanding would be, well, isn't that a technical foul now? Well, because, because the ball hasn't entered play. Because the technical foul so hasn't ball, been yeah, yeah. Yeah, it had been released at the hands of the, from the sideline. It certainly was passed, but yeah. if it hasn't entered play, yep. so the rule is that now a tech foul. Mm. And should, should Perth have had a free throw and then another side out? That's what so, John really, uh, what John really thought. Did he? Okay, yeah. yeah. He so yeah. it's an interesting one. Um, I would have liked to have seen Usher at the line again to see, <laughs> yeah. to see if, he, uh, if, he was, if he was ready to, to make amends, but. Um, yeah, well, it was just we saw that anyways. But um, yeah, it was it was a crazy last three and a half minutes, and then obviously the overtime, and it was a wild night. Um, yes, you know, it, it was the team that made the fewest errors down the stretch, I guess, won. Let's talk about the Perth Wildcats. We had a we had a long discussion I did with Cody last week about all the problems at the Perth Wildcats, and and I guess the the poor decisions we felt that John really had made the week before, and. Against the, in that loss to the to the Brisbane Bullets, and then you know the changes that we wanted to see this week, and we saw a lot of them. I mean, some of these numbers. Bryce Cotton turned back into Bryce Cotton across the weekend, so he had fifty three points in the two games, and they were plus thirty two with him on the court. But I think it was it was when you dive a little bit deeper. So Jesse Wagstaff didn't play at all, and we talked about what a mistake we thought that was last week against Brisbane. But he played thirty seven minutes, really important minutes across these two games, and when he was on the court. They were plus 23. And I think Hiram Harris, I, I'm not sure why he didn't play after halftime last night, but that's something for John really. But up until that point, against Adelaide, he was massive. I think he was the most important player in that game, as good as Bryce Cotton was. And even in the first half against Melbourne, he had his, his moments. So I think him starting was crucial. And then Jordan Usher actually found his groove, like we talked about, coming off the bench. And they were plus 26 with him 
on the court. And Christian Doolittle finding his his feet as well. They were plus 19 with him against Melbourne United. Those were the positives. What what do you think of what the changes John really made this week and, and how, how they worked? Well, they clearly worked at 2-0. Mm, um, yeah. So congratulations to John. Um, I, I think it, it's always difficult um, benching an import player, mm. um, but it had to be done. And, um, yeah, I thought Hiram Harris's efforts in that starting lineup in both games yeah. were... were very, very strong. Um, I really I agree with you in his um, performance against Adelaide. I thought he was a real key instigator in that game. I, I guess the, the double-edged sword on that one is, one, removing Usher from the starting five I think is really important because I think it's going to help Bryce. I mean, Bryce is not always super aggressive to start the game anyways. But what I would love to see is a few more sets for Bryce and, and, and really put the pressure on Bryce to try and get his early because... We saw that in the Adelaide game, although you know, the scoreboard was ticking over, Bryce wasn't necessarily getting a lot of touches. And then when Usher came into the game, I think he had three shots up within yeah. three and a half seconds, and, and Bryce was still sitting there with, with, with not a lot of touches. So um, I still think there's some management there, um, but John knows his roster a heck of a lot better than I do, and, and I, I, I trust that he, he'll find that balance. But I think it's certainly shifting in the right direction. I think Hiram Harris brings that, uh, he brings a lot of the intangibles. Mm. that Jesse Wagstaff also possesses. There was, a, there was a, a, a moment last night, I haven't watched it back, but I think it was in the overtime where there's three Melbourne United guys go up for a rebound and there's Wagstaff with his two-inch vertical in amongst the middle of them. And he manages to somehow get the ball to ground and he dives on the loose ball. Is that when he forced the jump ball? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and those are plays that... Outside of himself and Hiram Harris, there's not a guy out there that, that I truly trust is going to make that play. Yep. Um, maybe Doolittle. He, he seems yeah, yeah, to have yeah, a little sure. bit of that endeavour. But, but it doesn't seem like a natural basketball play for a lot of the guys on the Perth roster. So, um, you know, I think having Wagstaff out in that moment was really key. Those are the reasons why a guy like Wagstaff can, can contribute and make your team better. Say that's for Hiram Harris as well. I yeah. think he just makes you a better basketball team. Without going back over old ground, how surprised were you in that Brisbane game that Jesse didn't hit the floor at all? Um, so, I'm not 100% across why. Uh, I don't know if he was carrying a little something um, into the game. I, I I didn't make judgment at the time. The the one thing I wouldn't do, and I know that there's a lot of a lot of media mm. about Jesse's 450th game. I think it was. Yep. Um, his, his game, his milestone game was actually the game the week before. Right? Yeah, it was. But they used this whole week, that whole week as a celebration. They used it as a celebration. Of yeah. 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 Look, I, I I'm probably cutting against the grain a little bit. I, I don't think milestones are a reason to. To play somebody, no. But having said that, and, and knowing how the Red Army operates, and, and I'm a big fan of Jesse Wagstaff. I, I think he brings a lot to the, to the table, especially, so, when the, especially when the team was playing poorly that that night as well. Yeah, yeah. So, look, I'm not going to uh, again. I'm not making a judgment on him not playing because I don't know the reasons for him not playing. But he's someone that I always find value in nine times out of ten, and. Uh, I think if he was healthy, he's probably going to make a, uh, a contribution in that game. Mm. Um, if he's not, he's got a little niggle and he's not a young man anymore, no. um, then maybe maybe it, it was a, the right idea to keep him out. I, I'm not across the situation mm. close enough. Now, I think sometimes when we're, we're, we're talking from uh, outside the inner circle, then we are really only speculating. Yeah, I think he's a guy who brings... He's got great intangibles. I think Hiram Harrison has great intangibles. I think this is a team that misses that. I don't think you get it out of the Websters. You know, Bryce is Bryce. He's a, he's a blue chipper. Mm-hmm. You want him doing blue chip things. Yes. And, and Sarah's just a kid uh, and not overly physical. So, you know, and, and I don't think it's natural for Usher um, mm-hmm. in any way, shape or form to be doing those sorts of little things. But, uh, so I think there's a place for one or two of them on the court at almost uh, all moments to be honest. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the positives. I mean, some of those positive numbers from the two games for Perth, you know, like I said, Bryce was plus 32, Wagstaff plus 23, Usher plus 26, and then Doolittle plus 19 against Melbourne. It's not all about plus minus, but it does give you a little bit of an indication of the impact the guys are having. So 
The total opposite of that across the two games was Corey Webster. He didn't play a lot of minutes across the two games, but when he was out on the court, they were minus 26. Are we going to see less and less of him, do you imagine? Yeah, I think so. I, I think he's um, I think he's been parked. I think it's the, the realisation that with all that talent out there that they need a little bit more grit. And I don't think he's going to play a whole lot from here on um, mm. unless results turn around. Like even in that, the Adelaide game um, in Adelaide, he actually played pretty well. He came on the floor and did pretty well, but then he got benched and parked. And, yeah, he didn't play and at all the fourth quarter. The yeah. quarter. Yeah, and he actually played well in that game. So I, I think I think for the immediate future, um, we're going to see very little of Corey Webster um, if they're fully healthy. Mm. All right, last one on the on the Wildcats because I I, I don't think it's your favorite favorite topic, Simon. And then we'll we'll take a break and talk about some other no, things. I like the Wildcats. <laughs> <laughs> Is two games enough to suggest that they've turned the corner or do you need to see a little bit more? No, I definitely want to see a little bit more. Uh, uh, though they won both games and um, they they are great victories, uh, I wasn't overly impressed with their performance in either. Um, I thought there was a real Jekyll and Hyde game versus Adelaide at home um, and without a doubt they benefited from... Um, you know, a little bit of misfortune to Melbourne United um, and, and some of their players um, losing Travers in the first minute um, for all intents and purpose, um, losing up Porty for the game as well. And, um, and then, of course, a little later on, missing Clark, who yeah. was killing them. So, um, and, and I think the loss of Clark is a big one. I think that really exposed some of the weaknesses of Melbourne United, current backcourt of Daly and Illy. And maybe some of the struggles that they're having with their efficiencies, especially, it was certainly Shay Illy. He's been very inefficient and struggling from at the offensive end. But Clark is a floor spreader. You have to play him every moment of the game. And that opens up just a little more space for, for you know, Matthew Delavadova. I mean, they, both, everyone in Melbourne United was really aggressive. They, they just ran ball screens to get Bryce into the on ball and then, and then just clear out and let everyone go ISO on Bryce. Um, you know, they obviously made Bryce the target. They, they worked him over at one end um, defensively. I thought Illy and, and Delavadova were wonderful in their efforts off the ball, just chasing him around everywhere. Yeah. And then they looked to punish him at the defensive end and, and you know, it may have worked against Melbourne a little bit, um, I think, down the stretch. So I think Melbourne at full um, strength, um, you would say, okay, Perth really nailed that one. But I thought there was a little bit of the basketball gods smiling upon Perth in that game. I thought um, Usher's three balls that he made in the last quarter were a little questionable. Um, the first one, certainly, the step back on Daly, I thought, geez, you wouldn't want to live and die by that one. But he made it, so yeah. great shot yeah. in the golf flight. And then, obviously, the one with seven seconds to go, you'd be like, oh, maybe just chew a little time <laughs> yes. off the clock there. Um, but then there was an element of Benny Hill music to, to some of the possessions as well. So, But what I did like, it was just that intensity on the offensive boards, which is a huge turnaround for Perth. So coming back to your initial question, am I on Perth right now? No, I have them actually about where I thought they would be this, this season, which is a, a potential playing team. I don't see them as a top four team. I don't think the roster is balanced enough. I don't think they have enough grit, um, but they certainly proved themselves to be a play-in potential because leading to this, now, up to this point, they haven't even looked like a play-in team. No, they haven't. No. I think we'll learn a lot Friday night against New Zealand. The Breakers are a team that you have to beat. They'll make you beat them. I mean, it's... So I think we'll learn a lot, and we can talk about that a bit later. But let's take a break, Simon. Then when we come back, we'll talk about some other things outside of Perth going on in the NBL. He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch. Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Okay, back on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I'm joined by Simon Mitchell, the former South East Melbourne, Melbourne Phoenix coach. Um, let's get stuck into some other things that stood out in round six to me, Simon, and get your thoughts. I wanna, there wasn't a lot of great execution late in games, so we talked a little bit about the Perth and, and Melbourne game, but a couple more things that stood out. There was a, I don't know if you saw this, down in Launceston, Tasmania and Brisbane, that was a horrible last two minutes from both teams. Neither team could execute. There wasn't a stop in play at all for the whole two minutes. And I know Justin Schiller was frustrated because he desperately wanted to get Chris Smith into the game to have an extra shooter, but there wasn't a stop to allow him to do that. So neither team scored in the last two minutes. And I don't know if either team got the looks they were hoping for. 
The last couple of minutes from DJ Vasilovic for Adelaide in Perth. Sometimes you've got to remember that you've got teammates out there as well. And I'm fascinated to get your thoughts on DJ because you're, you've got a lot of experience coaching against him. I'm not sure it was a great shot that Parker Jackson Cartwright took late in the game for the for the breakers, either on Sunday against against the Kings and then, as you've talked about, lack of ball movement late in the game for Melbourne United. Um, you know, get your thoughts on what you're seeing late in games right now. Yeah, I, was, I think one of the things that is short in pre-season for some of these clubs and, and not having players available is that you don't have your closing five. Mm-hmm. Um, you haven't had the time you spend in pre-season you know, working out how you finish games. Um, and I've got no doubt sometimes you get a week like this, you're going to have, you know, 10 teams feverishly working on their late game strategies this week on yeah. the floor. But it is something that quite often it, it shouldn't be parked um, towards the, the back of your preseason. But if you don't have everybody on the floor, um, it is hard to sometimes get into execution mode. So the one thing I think it's throughout um, the league that I've seen from, from the start of the season, trailing into pre-season, is it's just the amount of isolation basketball that we're, we're, we're um, settling on. Um, I don't think that's the strength of the NBL. I don't think it's the strength of NBL players. Obviously, there are players that are absolutely great at it. Yes. Um, but I've always thought a little bit of ball movement, getting the defense to actually play a little bit rather than settle in and then you know move up the lane a little bit and, and, show, a, and show a wall to the ball, um, is that, you can create greater spacing with some ball movement prior to it. And I think we've, we've, we've moved past that. It looks like, you know, we've leaned a little heavier towards the NBA yep. this season yep. than what we have in the past. We've always been kind of a melting pot of European theory versus NBA theory. And it seems to me that maybe we've just taken that step too far towards the NBA. Yep, Bryce Cotton should be a target down the stretch, but maybe we can get him coming off a few ball screens and, and, and actually having to, to chase a little bit before you try an ISO, um, rather than just hitting one ball screen, getting the switch, and then just backing it up and, and charging at him. So, yeah, look, uh, it wasn't terribly great. I think uh, our compadre Cody Alice um, mentioned that four or five of the games this week were decided by the team who messed up the least um, <laughs> down the stretch. Yeah. And, yeah, and you know, I think there's an element of truth to that. Um, but look, having having coached in this league, there's you can you can train the heck out of your late game situations. And when the the whips are cracking, the lights are on. Um, sometimes that goes out the window. Um, I've seen that many a time where you know you've, you've got your late plays that you want to execute, and you just don't. You know, the players get uh, get a little bit uh, anxious, and uh, you know they they put the they shoulder a load that's uh, Perhaps you don't want them shouldering. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the other thing that's standing out right now, and I, I can't wait to get your thoughts on this as a, as a coach fresh out, uh, no, fresh, <laughs> fresh out of the game. Um, I mean, if you ta- if you put your coach's hat to the side right now, I think we're in the entertainment business. So if you're trying to watch as a spectator, is the amount of fouls we're seeing called right now taking away from the spectacle of the game? Yes. Mm. Yes, it is. It, it's. It's not good. Um, oh, look, uh, I don't want to be that old bloke you yearned for <laughs> yesterday, but uh, I, I never liked the move to three referees. Yep, yep. <laughs> I've always the reason we went to three referees was so old guys in the NBA could hang on for a few extra years. Yes, yeah, you know, they could <laughs> make bank and continue to make bank. <laughs> and we adopted it in the NBL, and yeah, I'm not sure we have the talent levels in our referees department to have three referees. And I really don't like some of the calls off the ball where you look at it and you're like, oh, geez, did that matter? <laughs> um, there was a call down in Tassie uh, late in the game against Marcus Lee on a rebounding yes. contest. Uh, Mitch Norton, who, who, who at the best of times gets a good whistle, mm-hmm. um, kind of threw himself a little bit, yep. hamming it up on, on the slightest of contact. He got the baseline referee calling that. And that cannot happen. You cannot allow those calls to infiltrate the game. But we saw on numerous occasions calls that just don't need to be made. Yep. You know, sometimes there's a little bit of a tie up between two players. Let's see if they get untied before blowing the whistle. But the rebounding, the rebounding ones really get stuck in my core. 
the players yesterday have to make an adjustment. Absolutely. But sometimes there's three different interpretations of the same event mm-hmm. on the floor mm-hmm. um, within a game because we have three referees out there. And, and those inconsistencies can make it very difficult to try and adjust to. I think when back in the day when there was two referees, it was a little easier to make those adjustments. But, yeah, look, you know, there's, we saw in that Brisbane Southeast game, there was it seemed like the whistle never stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, the players were a little slow to make adjustments, but then there were some poor calls as well. So yeah, look, it, it, it's it's something that uh, I know that Scott Butler will be working with his referee crew this week. Um, but what we can't have is the public. Yep, they're all there commentary because it's not. They're not all there. And even if you want to state um, to the letter of the law that call, you could make it. We don't want to see a lot of these calls. Let it go. Let the game flow a little bit. What about some of these numbers from the game, the games in round round six? I I don't know the official numbers, but I feel like the average would be somewhere around thirty fouls a game. I, I that's a number off the top of my head. But some of these numbers you touched on Brisbane South East Melbourne game last Thursday, fifty two fouls in that game for seventy seven free throws. Again, the Phoenix against the Taipans, fifty fouls, fifty six free throws, and then Melbourne and Perth a little bit skewed because it went to overtime, but still sixty one fouls, seventy nine free throws. Is there anyone in the world that's tuning in to watch fouls and free throws? No. <laughs> no, we've got to protect our product. Mm. Um, and look, I'll, I'll share a little story from a coach's perspective and a recruiting perspective. Um, you know, our, our, our first year in the league, the referees brought in the really any sort of contact to foul. Like they, and they said this is the way forward. Like the NBA, they weren't going to use the hot iron one. It's just no contact. We want mm. to get the the ball blowing up and down the floor. So we recruited players that we felt would thrive in that in that system. Mm. Then the following year, they start cracking down and letting, or not cracking down, letting things go a little more. And you're like, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> you, you said this was going to be up and down and we've recruited players that we, we probably could do with a little bit more physical, uh, more physical players now. And, and, and so even from the way you set up your, your team, yeah, is somewhat, um, you know, detrimental to, or sorry, it's it's in accordance with the way the game was being refereed. You know, maybe we could have gone with better defenders if we thought that, uh, you know, and passed up on some of our shooters that we had um, in that that second year or that third year even. Um, So, yeah, it it does. It it affects the way you recruit, the way you see the game, the offenses that you run. But right now, I don't see a pattern. Mm. I just see a lot of a lot of calls. Like even you go know, back to that Brisbane South East game. Um, you know, you get Banger out there. He's pushing guys into screens. They're calling offensive fouls. Yeah. Well, that's just the wrong call. Yeah. yeah you, as a player, you can't make an adjustment to that. No. Uh, I think it was Big Snores coming off with a DHO. He got pushed into the defender. He gets the foul. I think it's his fourth. Yeah, it was. It's like well. Yeah, what do you? There's no adjustment you can make to that. That's just an incorrect call, and you've seen a lot of them. There's too many, um, and they're missing the right, the, the ones that need to be called sometimes. Putting your coach's hat on, then, when when you're coaching in a game where so many of these calls are being made, and it, it does affect what you send your players out there to to do, because they might not be allowed to go and do what you do if they're getting called. But also, when you've got guys getting into foul trouble, it just disrupts everything you're doing with your, your plans for the, for the game as well. How tough is it when there's games like this where there's so many fouls being called to coach? Yeah, you've really just got to nail down the the, the basics um, and, and emphasise the importance of your wall-ups and being straight up. You know, don't reach in. The fundamentals of, of defence has really got to be where you stress. Some of these things you can't control. And, and, and look, the human element's going to come into it. There's going to be incorrect calls. Mistakes are made. Well, certainly the teams are making mistakes as well, and maybe that amplified some of the refereeing mistakes. But it's something that you've got to – don't let the referees become a factor into the way that you're playing. Mm. Okay, yes, we should be on point at all times in regards to our defensive posture, the way we slide, the way we fight over screens, the way we wall up. Those are important things, whether the fouls being called or not being called. So those are the focus, not the fouls. Yep, yep, no. I guess it's a good perspective to have this season for you when you're not coaching. How much how how much time do you spend when you are coaching thinking about or finding answers from the referees during the week? Does it does it occupy a lot of your focus when you're in the bubble? 
Maybe too much, yeah. yeah. I, I'll, I'll put my hand up and say I would I would spend a little bit too much time. Um, I think I got better at it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I know there's been times where I, I would send 75 clips from a game and say, Scott Butler, explain this to me. <laughs> you know? um, you'd get an explanation and you agree or you disagree, but nothing's accomplished. Um, and you go out there the next week and you probably see the same thing. So... It's more about, okay, can you tell me how can I get Alan Williams? I need to keep him on the floor. Mm-hmm. Give me some, can, here's some clips. Tell me what I can teach him better. Tell me what I can do to Alan Williams, what advice I can give him to keep him on the floor in this one. Um, and you, I, I found it far more effective of working with the head of referees rather than just, hey, this is not working. You guys suck. <laughs> do better next game. Yeah. That's not going to. It's not going to change. It's not going to be better next game. So find ways where you can find influence and find ways that you can um, make your players better. Would be my advice mm-hmm. to the current coaching club. Good segue. I want to talk to you about Alan Williams and also Gary Brown. So the South East Melbourne Phoenix are going going well. They did have a slip up against Brisbane, but bounced back well against the Taipans. And they're six and four. And I mean, like, like like we talked about with you for the last four years, once you're at full strength, and Cody talked about this last week, we always knew that South East Melbourne, when you're at full strength, you're a really good team. And that's, again, been a problem this year. And Gord Jack Gack um, is, is out at the moment. They didn't have Will Cummings, but they still managed to beat Cairns. Um, but I want to get your thoughts on Alan Williams and Gary Brown. Right now, I think there's a pretty strong case you can make that Big Source is the best centre in the league and, and that Gary's the best point guard. Yeah, um, I think there's probably a, a case for a few players in those positions, but I, I think certainly Alan Williams um, at the centre spot right now has been heavily influential since coming into the team. Um, I think people have maybe forgotten just about how good he was, mm. you know, with calls. But, oh, maybe they could keep Tyler Cook. Well, hang on a minute. Alan <laughs> Williams is pretty darn good. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he's still finding himself a little bit too, mm. like, and I've spoken to Alan, he, and he, he came in in better shape this year. Mm-hmm. Um, he's obviously had a little bit of a niggle with the knee, but um, he, he's come in, he looks great. Um, you can see the, the second effort on the boards, um, that pop is back. Yeah, he's just got to, again, he's got to keep himself out of foul trouble. And, mm-hmm. you know, like he's averaging 40 minute uh, stats in, in, in half a game right yeah. now. Yeah. So. If he gets up to 26, 27, 28 minutes a game, um, you know, he's going to be campaigning for MVP. Yeah. But, um, yeah, look, he, he brings a point of difference as well um, in that he's, he's post-play. Um, one of the things I think we see around the NBL is maybe a lack of post-play right now. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's good to see JLA back at MU. Um, and they're opening up the playbook a little bit. So um, their, their two shakes has, has come into – sorry, their shakes up has come into play. So they're parking him down there and they'll, they'll throw the ball into him. And, and it's not necessarily for a shot. Um, he gets his dribble out. So you see in the sideline plays that they ran against Perth, they post to dally up and, mm. and then they brought Chris off some, some screens. So, you know, it's not necessarily – it needs to be a shot out of the post, but running the offense from different angles, I think, is important. And I think that's made Southeast fairly potent um, from an offensive standpoint in that they're giving teams different looks from different angles and it makes it a little harder to defend. What about Gary? I remember he, he started last season injured and then I remember the first game he played last season, we instantly saw the difference in your offense. And I remember asking you post-match about you know, the different difference he made immediately. And he, he's running this team really well right now. I mean, you wouldn't have recruited him if you didn't think he was capable of, capable of this, but are you enjoying seeing what he's doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I bumped into him actually on Saturday morning mm. and gave him a big hug and just told him that you know, how happy I am to see him making shots, making free throws and making a yeah. three ball, which kind of deserved it <laughs> last year yeah. um, a little bit. But um, he's someone I've got a lot of time for. We hit it off straight away. The year before we recruited him, uh, he and I we were talking on uh, on uh, online and, and, and just uh, we hit it off straight away. And yeah, he's a wonderful player, wonderful talent. Look, I still think there's a feeling out process with him and the, his teammates. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure... And even him and Mike, to a degree. Yeah, uh, yeah. Gary Gary is an amazing player, but does have a tendency to over-dribble the ball at times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think those moments certainly happen when he's just not comfortable with some of the guys on the floor. 
Um, and we, we experienced that last year. And then all of a sudden, you, as he gets more comfortable with the players, he's, the teammates around him and where they want the ball, the ball moves a little quicker. And I just see him finding his way right now with some of these guys. Unfortunately for the South East is that he just hasn't had those minutes on the floor with all of those players just yet. But I, I mm. think that the great thing from that, the perspective I love of that is that it's only going to get better yeah. if they can maintain some habits. How important is it when you can get a get an import to come back for a second season? I mean, there's so many so many instances we can point to where an import is better in his second season once he understands the league. How important was it for Southeast to bring back both both those guys this year? Yeah, really important. Um, I mean, obviously, Source was signed. Um, oh, I might be telling tales here, but Source was signed fairly early last year, no, absolutely, um, and maybe quite earlier than it was released. Mm. Um, so there was one of the things Tommy and myself talked about was the need for some continuity, especially in the imports. We hadn't found someone that we wanted for that second year. Ty Wesley was certainly someone we would have loved to have had us in the second year, but he called time on his career. His body had, had said enough. And, and then from that point, we really hadn't found the guys that we wanted to build around. I mean, Source, it's a pretty obvious one with Source, just his personality as well and the way he's embraced the league and the way the, the, the basketball public have embraced him. I think he's he, he's really connected to the NBL. And, um, and I think that's, well, that's not the reason to bring someone back. It certainly is a, an added an, an add on to, to what he brings on the floor. Uh, Gary Brown, I, I, I'm not sure how that all um, happened this year. Um, I'm sure Gary would have uh, hunted around to see what was out in the marketplace, and, uh, and I dare say that maybe Southeast Melbourne were also seeing what was in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Then at some point in time, they looked at each other and said, "Well, let's do it again." You know, we weren't so bad. <laughs> um, I feel like the fact that he, feel like the fact that he and Creaky were playing together in Puerto Rico must have had a big, a big part in that too. Yeah, potentially, but you know, like with a new coach coming in, it, it, it needs to be that that Mike was um, comfortable with him as well, and um, and I think uh, over time that that comfort will uh, will only increase. Uh, Gary, wonderful human being, great guy to have around the clubhouse, and um, you know those are. And I'll throw Trey Kelly in there as well. All yeah. three blokes last year, I, I think, were really um, enamoured themselves to their teammates, and uh, you know. That's probably why you see Trey still in the league as well. Well, that's a nice segue as well because I wanted to get your thoughts on the 36s because Trey Cal's playing, playing really well. But I know speaking to speaking to Cody Ellis about this game on on Saturday against the Wildcats, it felt like the most important moments of the game were probably from about four minutes to go until about two minutes to go, and Trey Cal was Adelaide's best offensive weapon. Then CJ Bruden sat him. I don't know if Trey wanted a breather or. CJ thought he needed a breather, but by the time he came back into the, into the game, the game was gone. I don't, I don't know what you felt about those final minutes, but that felt like the moment that Adelaide lost the game. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it seems a while ago now. Did DJ <laughs> yes. come in for him? Uh, Sunday, Sunday did. Yeah, Sunday did, okay, yeah. To, to touch upon what you, you first said, uh, I think Trey's really showing what he's capable of in, at Adelaide. You know, another guy who struggled to get on the floor in preseason last year, um, put on a little bit of weight while he was injured. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a naturally a pretty heavy kid. Mm. Um, and then when he got back on the floor, it was okay. It took a little time for him to, to, to find his his place. And, and, and in our postseason talks, um, you know, he, he revealed he lost a bit of confidence in his shot, okay. um, which is something that you don't often hear from from your imports. He's like, yeah, I, I just lost a little bit of mojo on my shot. And um, he certainly got it back. And it's I'm really happy for him. And I'm happy for CJ and, and the staff there at Adelaide that they're seeing. Um, I don't think they're even seeing the best of Trey Cal just yet. Mm-hmm. I've got huge wraps on the young man um, as a player. But I think they're, they're about to see and they will see everything that he can bring to the table. And he's certainly having a great season for them. Now, in regards to, to him coming out late in the game, um, yeah, look, it's a, I won't say it's a head scratcher. It's one of those ones that raised an eyebrow. Yes. And so, oh, well, I wonder what happened there. <laughs> I wonder if he's okay. I wonder if he took a bump. Mm. I wonder if he's got his gas wonder what the reason is for that. But we don't know. So no. I'm not going to speculate. Again, uh, I've got so much respect for CJ and 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 he knows his ball club. Um, he knows what his ball club needed at that moment. And for mugs like me and you on the sidelines <laughs> these days, we can always drop the, uh, 
I've got the answer after it all happened. <laughs> but yeah, look, if, if he was healthy, um, then then I think he should be in the game for sure. Yeah. The other thing I was fascinated by. In Adelaide's last two wins against Perth and then going over to New Zealand, Isaac Humphreys was such a big part of everything everything that they did. He was back to his his dominant best, but he almost was forgotten about in this game. Who, whose fault is that? Is that his teammates not giving him the ball? Is it him not demanding the ball enough? Is it things not being run for him? Why, do, why does that end up happening? Yeah, look, it, it happens to all teams at, at points in the game. I mean, you could say Melbourne United, you know, Chris yeah. didn't see the ball as much in the second half after getting a bit of a hot hand early. Um, you know, there's always periods in the game where people want to see the studs with the ball in their hands. And, and Isaac Humphreys is that guy. He, he, he's been really effective in pick and rolls with, with uh, DJ Bazilievich, um during, during his uh, tenure with the club. Um, and, yeah, we didn't see quite as much. Look, they went with different matchups. I, again, I don't know the reason for it, but I think Isaac Humphreys, at his best, is right in there with the in the argument of you know who's the most effective uh, center in the league. And the thing with Isaac compared to say like an Alan Williams or a JLA um, is that we just haven't seen it as much out of him as we have those two guys um, because of his health. Um, but if we go back three seasons ago, um, I thought he was the most dominant player in the league. And, uh, yeah, look, they look better when he's on the floor playing well. I'll say that much. Um, they certainly look better when he's on the floor playing well. So he's certainly a key to their success. All right, Simon, last last topic in this discussion, then we'll turn our attention to the week ahead. The Ill- Illawarra Hawks. I know Cody's sick of saying the same old Hawks, but right now it's tough to say anything else about them. They lost to Sydney by, by 20, and to be honest, that scoreline probably flattered them a little bit. They're two and six. I keep asking Cody this question, and Cody can't answer in the affirmative too much. So I'll ask you, do you see many positives for the Hawks right now, and is there much hope for them for the rest of this season? Uh, the positives. Mm. I should be slapped in the face with a positive. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I can't think. You know, I mean, really, you should be. You should yeah, be. Yeah. Most teams that are travelling well, you're like, oh, they're doing this well or doing that well. I can't really think of a, a positive right now for Illawarra, but I could certainly think of a lot of things they need to do better. It's 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 a really frustrating, it's been a frustrating start to the season for the Illawarra Hawks. I think a lot of people had high expectations for them this year. Mine probably weren't as high as others. They're, they're coming off three wins. Um, and whilst the the roster is certainly um, preferable to what it has been, um, I don't think it's where it needs to be just yet. Mm. I think there's a lot of players that have similar attributes um, there's a sameness in their skill sets, yep. and I don't know if the balance is quite there. For me, defensively, they're not good, but when they look or when they have their most success, even when um, when they've been able to junk it up a little bit, so after free throws, they can extend it up the floor a little bit, and they go into a bit of a zone, and it, it just it shouldn't catch teams by surprise, but it somehow does, and they've been able to just junk it up a little bit. But when they're just playing one out, they've really struggled um, as they did last year. And that's the disappointing part. But I'm not sure the way out for them just at the moment. Mm. Uh, the inconsistency in their backcourt, particularly at the defensive end, yes. is what frustrates me as someone who wants to see Jacob succeed and I want to see Illawarra playing really good basketball. I would put it on the import pairing in the backcourt and say, firstly, you need to defend. Yeah. You need to defend at a much higher level. You owe it to your coach. You owe it to your teammates. You owe it to the fans and your organisation. And I think the inconsistencies right now are, are too prevalent. I also think Sam Foley needs a little bit of a rocket. You know, he he's just seems to me to be a good, solid player right now, and they need a little bit more out of him. Um, so the the I guess the positive is that they can be better. But the, you need, geez, you'd like to hang your hat on something more than we have the potential to be better. You'd like to see it, and um, I think right now we're just not seeing. For me, I go back to the Adelaide game when they lost, um, and also the Tassie. That weekend hurt me. That really, like as, as as an observer, I was really intrigued to see how they went. I spoke to Jacob that week, um, and you know, really looking forward to seeing an improvement in them that weekend. And the the loss to Tasmania was really, really bad. Some of the defensive possessions, particularly from their backcourt, 
I thought were an abomination. That's um, the one they lost by thirty, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in the the, the Adelaide game, I, I mean, we saw it again. You got a struggling team at home, all the pressures on them, and then you see Tyler Harvey getting back cut. You see Tyler Harvey giving up an offensive rebound to a rookie next star. Yep. You see the next star come out and drop eighteen in the final quarter, and he's being guarded by your imports, yeah. and, and, um, or not guarded by your imports. And, 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 and in, fa- and in fairness, the Flowers hasn't done anything since then either. No, no. I, I think it was one of those situations where. Um, he was in a good situation that he had a, an import point guard uh, in Justin Robinson who he could get under on balls and meet him on the other side and he wasn't going to be hurt by it. Fighting over the on ball can be a little bit of an issue for him um, but when he can just get himself underneath the on ball and meet him there, he, there was no there was no punishment coming his way. But I, I, I put that last heavily on those, those two as to being, okay, you got your butt kicked in Tassie, this is your time to stand up and I was almost disappointed that we saw the heroics um, in the down the stretch that Tyler Harvey hit that game winner because I think all of a sudden he's a clutch player and um, you know he's this and he's that and he's everybody's and for me I'm just stuck on that weekend um, and, and I want to see Tyler present himself better um, at that end of the floor. I want to see he's he, look, he's an eloquent speaker after the game. He says all the right yeah, things. He, he, he seems very sincere about it. At his best, when you know the moments when he was playing under Brian, whilst you could see some of the uh, the erratic plays at the defensive end, he played hard enough that uh, you know you couldn't uh, always take advantage of it. And I'm just not so sure we're seeing that for whatever reason. Mm. Maybe he's carrying an eagle. I don't know, but I don't think the effort or the intensity um, is there at, at the moment, and and that's disappointing because um, you know the people of Illawarra have hung tough. And I think they need to be repaid. Enjoyed that breakdown, Simon. So thanks for that. And that's exactly why I wanted to get you on the show to get your get the, those sort of thoughts from you. But let's take a deep breath when we come back. Let's take a look at round seven in the NBL. He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch. Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Okay, back on Hoop Seven's Basketball Hustle. I'm with Simon Mitchell, and it's been a lot to cover so far, Simon. So we'll race through this final segment. But first of all, we need to get your Galen winner, the best team man in the NBL. I think there's some some candidates stepping up from the Perth Wildcats, but we might go across the ditch a little bit, will we? Yeah, I'm going to take this one. Um, I'm going to pack the passport and uh, head down to New Zealand and Anthony Lamb. Um, I was really impressed with him this weekend um, in both the win over Cairns and the loss against Sydney. Playing out of position, um, getting himself in the block and and playing bully ball against the guards, but then he's holding his own against the bigger players at the defensive end. I just thought he took really big, great strides this this round. Um, Announced himself as being amongst the uh, the elite players in our league. But not only that, I think he's, he's carrying his team in a position that maybe he's not played his whole life. Uh, so, yeah, playing, playing playing some minutes at the four. Um, geez, he might have even been playing some minutes at the five um, yeah, with him. And, yeah, and so, yeah, I think just him sacrificing his body and also being productive um, and, and rejuvenating New Zealand season this round, uh, I think he's, uh, he's my Galen winner. No, perfect. So, well done to Anthony Lamb. Let's get straight into round seven. Short, shorter round this weekend, Simon. So, Head to Tab Touch, download the Tab Touch app, or go to tabtouch.com.au. And as we get closer to the weekend, you'll see the odds there for each game, and we'll try and find you a winner. So, just the one game Friday night, the Perth Wildcats trying to keep their momentum going against Anthony Lamb and the New Zealand Breakers. And like I touched on earlier earlier in the show, this is where we'll find a true test for the Wildcats because the Breakers will not hand you anything. If you beat them, you burned everything, and they'll come into this game pretty motivated to to get their season back on track. Yeah, this is a real this is a real litmus test for Perth. Whilst New Zealand's down a few soldiers and they're still trying to work out how to how to best, I guess, play through that five spot and who's the person to do that. This is the time you probably want New Zealand. Yeah, you know, they don't think they've got it all worked out right now and defensively they're they're struggling. Mm. And I think Perth will get it at home. I think that the personnel that New Zealand have right now maybe 
isn't suited to, to what Perth is bringing. So Perth have been struggling on the boards. New Zealand's really struggling on the boards. Yes. Perth have made inroads into those issues. I'm not sure New Zealand have just yet, so I'm just going with Perth at home. No, it'll, be, it'll be fascinating. Um, okay, so we've got two double headers across the weekend. First up on Saturday, the Cairns Taipans and the Illawarra Hawks. So I feel like the Taipans are starting to get things back. I think they'll be they'll be expecting Pat Miller to come back for this game, so they'll be hoping that they'll be at full strength for the, for the first time all season. And after everything we talked about the Illawarra Hawks, gee, there's a bit of pressure on them. So what do you think of this one? Uh, I'm thinking that it won't be as ugly as the last time they played, which was probably the worst game of the season. Yes. Um, I'm going Cairns at home, um, and I'm hoping to see them in, 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 with a full roster. I'm excited to see Cairns and, and what Ford is doing with them once he's given the full deck, and he hasn't so far. And yeah, I'm a little intrigued as to as to what they what they're going to produce. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely with Cairns on that one. Second up on Saturday. This will be fascinating as well. So the Adelaide 36 is back at home, and I'm sure it's been a bit of a bit of a tough week for them coming off a loss in Perth, where I feel like they they should feel like they blew that game, but they're up against a Jack Jumpers team that bounced back against Brisbane, and they'll be looking to build some some momentum too. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, there's certainly opportunities um, left on the table against Perth. I, I'm going to go with. Tassie, but I'm not overly confident on this one. I feel like that Adelaide is inching their way to a good performance, but I don't think it's going to happen this week. Mm. Okay, first up on Sunday, we've got a throwdown. This is my first chance to talk to you about about throwdowns, and when you would talk about it as you were coach of the South East Melbourne Phoenix, you you didn't hide how much you hated Melbourne United. Was that was that genuine? Do you hate Melbourne United as much as you said, or did you have to put that hat on when you were coaching against them? Oh, look, there might have been a little bit of pantomime to it all, <laughs> a little bit of theatre. Um, had a wonderful life with Melbourne Tigers slash Melbourne United. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so I have a lot of history with that uh, with that club. Um, so hate's a pretty strong word. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, when you when you change your uniform, uh, the old the old company is is your you, your arch rival and your bitter sure. enemy. And just the fact that we have to share the uh, the city with them. Um, it brings a little added, uh, I guess, animosity. But there's some players on that team that I think I'm pretty open about. My um, Shay Elliott's been my favourite non-South East Melbourne Phoenix player, mm-hmm. although I'm not that high on his performances this year <laughs> at one of the four. But yeah, look, they've got some wonderful players, uh, fun to watch, some huge rap for Dee Vickerman and, and some people at the club, Trent Hotton and good mates with. So like, there's people there that I really, really, really care for. So, yeah, I don't think hate's quite the word I'll be using now. And I, I didn't watch their games right now, and I, I don't have feeling for most teams either way, to be honest. Yeah. I, I just hope to see really good basketball. I like to see my friends in the league do well. I want to see the coaches win um, <laughs> both teams a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, it's certainly... I'll probably feel... It'd be interesting, actually, for me to, to watch this one because I don't, I didn't have a really strong feeling in the last one in the first game of the season. Um, maybe because all the players weren't there for the Phoenix, yep. but I, I didn't really feel passionately about wanting Phoenix to win. I wanted Mike to win. I also wanted Dean to win, and I wanted the guys that I've had, you know, I've crossed paths with to, to to play well. So most of all, I just want people to come out unscathed and healthy. Yeah. Who do you think wins the game? Because it's you know it's first against third right now. It's well, a, I'm going for game. the team that's yeah, I'm going for the team that might be a little bit healthier at the moment, and that'll be Southeast. Um, I'm very concerned about um, some of the injuries that uh, that Melbourne United. I mean, it was real carnage out of this game for them. And well, um, you'd have to assume yeah. Travers and Clark both don't play. Well, without a doubt, and then obviously Huck Porty yeah. will have a question mark, which is going to put a lot of responsibility on uh, JLA. Um, as a five spot, um, obviously Rob Lowe will come back in and do what he does, and that's not Mr. Beat. Um, so let's not forget Rob coming into the team. So yeah, she's now. I think of that. It, it, that might sway me a little bit, but no, I, I just feel like I just feel like Ian Clark is playing his best basketball with the Melbourne United jersey that we've seen of him. We just aren't seeing enough of it, unfortunately. So I think with him missing, um, I'm going to lead towards South East Melbourne. Okay, last game in the round, Sydney Kings. So they, 
they got back to winning against the Hawks last last week, so they'll be looking to build on that. But Br- the Brisbane Bullets, they went, they went, they were one shot away from going four wins in a row, and now they've they've had eight days to get ready for this game at Kudos Bank Arena. So this is a good way to finish the round. Yeah, they've um, they've had a pretty nice draw, haven't they? The Kings are sitting yes. back on a Sunday afternoon waiting for it all to unfold. Um, I'm sure they'll find something to complain about it, but it, uh, regardless, um, yeah, this will be an interesting game. I think the Sydney Kings are a really good basketball team. Uh, we haven't seen the best of them by any stretch of the imagination, but I think we may see, uh, I think we're making progress. And with DJ Hogue back in the team now, um, now over the next couple of weeks, I think we're going to see a lot of growth in this team. So uh, I'm, I'm going to back the Kings on this one. I'll be barracking for Justin Shuler's bullets, mm-hmm. uh, but I dare say I've got utmost time and respect for the way the Kings have put this, assembled this roster, and I think they're going to be the big grower throughout the course of the season. No, look forward to seeing how it's all going to unfold. So head to head to Tab Touch, like I mentioned, download the app at Tab Touch or go to tabtouch.com.au. We'll help you find some winners. And Cody's picked out his exclusives, both some NBL and NBA exclusives for this week as well. So Check those out, and you're allowed to bet now, Simon, as well. So you might want to want to check those out. And I know Cody's enjoying being able to bet for the first time in his in his life on basketball as well. So thanks to Tab Touch for making that possible. But I'll wrap things up there, Simon. It's been a big show, and whatever's on your mind, why don't you finish it, finish off the show with whatever you like? Oh well, I guess probably step away from the NBL right now. What's on my mind right now? The WNBL, and mm. we saw the uh, the start of that season this week, and um, yeah, I, I just with with the the huge support that Australia has shown for women's sport in recent times, I really, really hope that everyone gets behind our WNBL. Um, we saw a great crowd in the Boomers v uh, Flyers game the other night. It was over three thousand people and a sellout at the uh, State Basketball Centre. But it'd be really nice to get a quality production um, on TV as well. So my thoughts uh, with that league and, and, and that starting up, and I'm uh, wishing all those athletes super well and uh, good fortune and good health. <laughs> He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead.